is one ugly puss, isn't it? Now look at this one. That's a really nice guy. But I wrote about this guy, and I'll tell you how it all started, how Slaughterhouse began. It didn't begin in my mind. He showed up at the door one day and asked me, are you a writer? And I said, yes. Can you write my story as I'm about to tell it to you? I said, sure. And that became that great feature, Slaughterhouse. In actuality, it didn't really happen that way. But Buddy is such a great guy, and we'll talk more about him later on. But the story first came into my mind in 1983. I was lying in bed, and I was mulling over uh, past disappointments, other scripts I'd written and bounced around Hollywood and had no luck with and got rejected. And uh, I was rolling around in bed, and I thought, what kind of feature could I write and really get going? And of course, horror seemed to be the best uh, genre for everyone to break into. So, and I liked horror. To me, horror is really great because uh, horror pictures kind of are like a roller coaster ride. You know, you you go up the roller coaster and you build up to something, and all of a sudden, ah, you go over the falls and you take a real big dip, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And that's what a horror picture does for kids, and I think that's why they like it. And I'm a 50-year-old kid. Okay, I'm 54. But uh, I really like horror pictures. And 10 years ago, or actually it was more, uh, it was 15 years ago when I actually thought about this picture, I thought, let's, let's do one that I can do for a low amount of money and uh, still give those kids a thrill. And, and let's be witty about it, because a lot of the horror pictures that I saw, a lot of the slasher movies, were not witty at all. They were like, OK, we'll kill the first guy, we'll kill the second guy, we'll kill the third guy, we'll, we'll slash a girl here and there. You know, uh, and uh, we had, had guys like, well, this guy. You know who I'm talking about. Well, look at Buddy took care of him <laughs> after the movie. But, uh, and we had this kind of guy, uh, whoopee do, you know? I wanted a guy that would really kind of give you some pathos along with the slashing. And that's why I came up with Buddy. Buddy, to me, is everybody's axe murderer. He's, Nice sometimes. You know, the great Al Capone once said, you know, you can get a long way on a smile, but you get a lot further with a smile and a gun. And that's kind of what Buddy's theory is about things. He's a nice guy. He loves his pigs. He loves people and all that. But don't mess with Buddy. Don't mess with his pigs, okay? Well, I, I wrote this picture, and it went through a lot of iterations. I didn't actually send it to Hollywood. I didn't give it to anybody because... I, I had had those experiences before on other features, on other scripts, rather. And I had worked on other people's features, and I'd seen what they'd done. And I thought, well, you can do one. And I was lucky enough to uh, hook up with a great producer, Jerry Enko, who's a friend of mine. We worked together in the industrial film area. And he and I got together. I wrote the script. Uh, we went out, looked for locations, and. Uh, put this thing together on a shoestring. Let me tell you, it was a, just a real shoestring. You know, as a writer, it's sometimes difficult. You have an image up here in your mind of your lead character. In this case, the Budster, Buddy. Now, who could play that character and bring him to life for you? Because up here, you've developed a certain feel, a look, a sense about that character. And it was very difficult. Uh, in my mind, when I was looking at different people, different actors who applied, to really get a good sense of the character that was up here. Could they really pull it off? And by and far, most of the people that we dealt with up in L.A. who tried out, just, they weren't the right people. I knew that. And I was out in front of the theater where we were trying actors out, taking a break. We are exhausted. We'd worked all day. And this rather short fellow walked up to me, big 300 plus pounder, smiled at me, rather homely guy. And he said, uh, I hear you're uh, trying out for a movie here. I said, I'm not trying out, maybe you are. <laughs> I said, and I knew up here, I said, this is Buddy. He was great. And he had a wonderful, just, he was a wonderful person. As it worked out uh, in the film, not only was he a great buddy, but he was a great friend, and he worked very hard on this picture. Problem with Buddy, the, the, the actor, was that he was probably 5'9", at best, 
300 and some odd pounds. He was the right size. He had the right look, everything. But he wasn't that tall. And uh, that was going to pose a problem because I needed this big, imposing character, you know, playing Buddy. Well, the magic of film. It all worked out because in a lot of the sequences, we built ramps so that when Buddy came up behind someone, he walked up and became large and uh, ominous behind that uh, character in front of him, for instance, and uh, was always bigger than the people around him. And uh, for Buddy's father, we picked a, a particular actor, Don Barrett, a very fine actor, uh, who was much uh, smaller in, in stature, so when we played the two of them together, it wasn't a problem. We didn't need the ramps and all that. Now, one of the other things about Buddy, something that was really fortunate, Buddy was a Missouri ranch hand, a farm hand. He'd grown up on the farm, and guess what he slopped? He slopped hogs. Perfect. Couldn't have a better guy for the part. Was not afraid to handle the pigs. In fact, he was our pig wrangler. He saved us a bundle because we didn't have to hire a guy that was familiar with hogs. Buddy loved hogs. In fact, I got a picture here. Uh, Oh, I probably shouldn't show this. I think this turned out to be an extramarital affair. Uh, but Buddy had no qualms about getting into the pen with uh, the pigs. He was wonderful. One day we went out to uh, do a personality sequence on Buddy. We had to do a few of those by uh, because after we edited the picture, we said, Buddy lacks these little personality vignettes. So a few of us went out there to the location, the exterior, and we did these little vignettes. One of them took place in the hog pen, and Buddy had to sit down in the hog pen, gather his real live hogs around him as if they were his German shepherd friends, and just schmooze with them and hug them, and caress them. These are his dogs, his German shepherds. Well. I said to Buddy, I said, Bud, uh, we'll clear the hogs out of the way. We'll put a bunch of cardboard down. You can sit on the hay on top of the cardboard so you don't have to sit in all the pig urine and things that were in there. It would really smell foul. And he said, oh, no, no, I'm used to this. No problem. He plunked down right in this mess, and he gathered the hogs around him. And uh, we were just going, oh, my God, <laughs> you know. Well, we took our Aeroflex, uh, it was a uh, C, 2C, and of course we put it on cardboard and we were all kneeling down on cardboard in the middle of this pen. And we did that sequence that turned out to be Buddy caressing his hogs, the cat appears, and we were holding the cat outside the frame of the uh, camera, of course, at all times. The cat would have taken off. It was a wild cat, belonged to no one. And we did that whole sequence that way. What we had to do, though, we had to dress him up a little bit. He wasn't just perfect. He was a little bit more clean cut than what he appeared to be in the, in the film. We uh, decided to throw in a few extra uh, teeth here for the Budster. And then from his chain around his neck, we hung his pigtail. And it's not a real pigtail. Uh, we did use in the picture mostly real mummified remains, but this wasn't because this had to last for three or four weeks. So this is a latex pig tail, but it uh, wrapped around his chain and hung from his, uh, his neck. And then, to, to flesh him out a little bit, every slasher needs something to slash with, and this is the, the Buddy axe. This is the big cleaver that Buddy uses throughout the picture. Now, where do we get such a beast? You wouldn't think that anybody would have what they call a bone cruncher cleaver, and that's what it actually is called. We went to Ellis Mercantile, who is in LA. It's a uh, prop house, and it's a very popular prop house. At that time, it was. And stuff scattered all over the place. It, it, it's just a marvelous place to visit. Anyway, I said, I need a large cleaver. The guy said, hmm. So he went back into the knife department, and he pulls out this drawer, and there it was, a brand spanking new, as he called it, a bone cruncher. And of course, we had to dress this up a little bit. Uh, we gave it to our prop guy, Mike Scaglione, and he put some fur around it from an old mink stole. We hung a cowbell from it. And at to the point in the film where you see Buddy with it, we actually had a rubber hoof on the end, a pig hoof, which I've uh, subsequently lost. But look at that baby. There isn't a meaner guy in town with this kind of cleaver. The exterior location of the slaughterhouse was a fabulous find. It had everything that we needed and more. We couldn't believe it. When Jerry found this thing, he couldn't wait to give me a call. So you got to get down and you got to see this thing. We were desperate for a good location. 
What it had when we saw it was not only a great exterior for a slaughterhouse, even though it was a food processing plant, a, actually a produce packing plant, but it had all this peripheral stuff, like a, a little lake that uh, was nearby. And we used that in the opening of the film. It had a pier on it. And the kids run out onto the pier, and they do a nighttime sequence out there. It was great. And then just within 100 yards was the packing plant, uh, the old bus where the girl gets chased by Buddy down through the bus and gets hacked up at the end of the bus. That was there. We didn't touch a thing. It was all there for us. We couldn't have found a better site anywhere. And the other thing is, it had pigs there. We were thinking, oh my God, we got to bring in 10 pigs or so to make it look like uh, an old hog plant. And uh, nope, it was all right there for us. Even the pens were so close to us, just the way you see it in the movie, with live hogs in there already. And we got permission to use those pigs and everything around the, the neighborhood there from the landowner. Our last reel is probably the most exciting of the picture, we hope, anyway. And that includes the storm sequence with lots of rain. We needed lots of rain and lightning. The lightning was no problem. We had 4K and 10K HMI lights, these huge lights. And we had shutters on those for the lightning. But the rain uh, was going to be a problem. Well, voila. The landowner says, oh, I have a pumper truck. And it has a fire hose on it. So he hooked us all up and he fired up this old truck and it supplied plenty of water through the fire hose and so all the rain that you see pouring on the windshield of the car, pouring down the front of the uh, slaughterhouse, that's all being fired on the set by one single fire hose. Well the picture was finally uh, completed and it was time to get together the cast, crew, friends, family, investors, everybody. Uh, and have our own private showing. We rented a big theater, big screen, Loma Theater. And unfortunately at the time it was playing Snow White, the re-release of Snow White. And we had rented the theater for just one showing and a lot of family members, a lot of mothers and their kids showed up to see Snow White and what did they find? They found a slasher out there in the parking lot running around. They weren't too happy with that. But we had a wonderful uh, party and everybody liked the film and we figured we're off, we can't lose, we're off and running. And the next thing was distribution through the theaters. Well, it was distributed by uh, Castle Hill and uh, it opened in Washington, D.C. So we decided to pack Buddy up, myself and one other person, and off we went on, and we went to Washington, D.C. for the opening. And we dressed Buddy up, and we put him out in front of the White House in hopes that the president uh, would invite him in. Uh, and when he didn't get invited in, Buddy just uh, came up with his own little placard here that says, slash the budget. Anyway, uh, but he did get to meet Ronald Reagan and Oliver North, and uh, to this day we're wondering if he was involved in some way with Iran-Contra, but we don't know. But he hit it off with the audience that we'd hoped he'd hit it off with, and that's the college student. He uh, was invited over to Georgetown once they knew he was in town, and uh, posed with the students, had arm wrestling uh, matches with the students, had a lot of fun, and they really got into it. And we figured, well, we have it knocked with the college crowd. Next, we hit the radio stations, and uh, Buddy was uh, in, interviewed on radio stations, but we kept him in his persona. We bring him into the radio station, and uh, the uh, interviewer would ask him some questions, and he would just go <laughs> and just snort, and then, of course, I would translate. And we had a lot of fun with that one. You know, I feel really fortunate to have had the chance to actually do a feature film, and I'd do another one in a blink. The problem is raising capital. Our investors did get paid back on Slaughterhouse, and they did give us phone calls for about a year afterwards saying, hey, we'd like to reinvest. But that was really small capital. And as we've mentioned, it wasn't uh, the amount of money that could keep us going, sustain us and our uh, families. I had children out there with their little mouths open all the time wanting uh, worms, and I couldn't feed them, uh, not on uh, nothing. So we needed next time to have a much bigger budget, one that we could pay ourselves some money to keep the whole thing going. And that just didn't materialize because uh, the problem was that it took almost 18 months to receive any money back from our initial investment. But I tell you, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. It was fabulous. Even though those were lean times and my wife worked hard to bring home uh, the bacon, so to speak, uh, it was something that I wouldn't have traded, and I don't think any of my family members would ever trade it. They, they loved it, too. And I would say that if you 
uh, have the in uh, inkling to do a feature, to get yourself involved with one, go for it. It's a lot of fun. It's tougher now than it ever has been because of the big budgets that are out there. But uh, you can do it if you really want to. And I'll tell you something, give me a call. I'm ready to do another one. Uh, I first got in the, involved in the project. Uh, Rick Rossler and I uh, were working for the Navy at the time doing training films. And uh, got a little bored on uh, doing your average Navy training film, and we decided to uh, think about doing something on our own, a feature film. And um, we were looking for a project, um, looked at the different markets and uh, some of the other films that, some of the other low-budget films that were making some money at the time, and uh, decided that uh, a horror film might be the thing to do. Um, so we took it from there, um, decided to, uh, on a budget and uh, how much money we could realistically raise. Uh, we came up with a figure of $110,000. Um, and um, just, like, uh, just like a new insurance salesman, we decided to uh, try and raise money from family and friends and um, put together a proposal. We uh, had a series of meetings in uh, San Diego and in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, meetings with our friends and potential investors. We formed a limited partnership uh, to raise money for the picture. Um, we decided that after we raised $50,000 that uh, that would be our point to go ahead and, and uh, proceed with the production and we started doing some uh, preliminary pre-production work uh, looking for locations um, and that sort of thing. With a, bu a small budget of $110,000 we felt it uh, very important to have a good crew to help us produce the film. Uh, we were very lucky and able to, to get a uh, camera crew from Hollywood to help us out. Uh, we had an excellent sound man uh, and we had other key grip type people that were all excellent and all were willing to work on uh, deferred compensation, which means that we would defer their pay and in some cases uh, a percentage of the net profits of the film. And I think that was, that was a big key for us in uh, pulling off what we did for this small amount of money, have a, a very professional crew that knew what they were doing. We came up with a 21-day shooting schedule for the film. Um, and of course, like any other thing, uh, you know, sometimes things don't go the way they're planned. And we wound up working probably 18 to 20 hours a day, I recall. Uh, on a couple of occasions, we had to stop shooting because the sun was starting to come up, and uh, then we'd wait a few hours and then start doing some of our our daylight scenes. After that, um, after our 21 days of of filming, we were out of money, and uh, so we shut down the production for a while. Went out and tried to find money to do the uh, actually the final scene or the final sequence of the film. Uh, we figured it would probably cost us uh, ten or fifteen thousand dollars to do that. Um, while we were looking for the money, we did have all of our uh, work print transferred to video, and we were doing a rough cut on uh, three-quarter inch video while we were looking for the money. Finally, uh, about three months later, after the after the uh, first principal photography was finished, uh, we were able to get a loan from a, a friend of mine, Ed Drees. Um, he gave us ten thousand dollars to complete the film, and uh, it was it was quite an undertaking to try and as assemble the cast and the crew, and again trying to get everything else together that we had done uh, three or four months previously to uh, complete the film. After we finished the principal photography, again we realized that we didn't have enough money to complete the picture. Uh, still needed a lot of money to uh, do the sound editing, the, the, uh, the work print editing, the sound mix, 
and uh, release prints, answer prints, that type of thing. So uh, we had to go out in search of money again and we had some interest from a foreign distributor and we had put together a two minute trailer and showed it to them and actually that's that's how we pretty much sealed our, our foreign distribution deal. Uh, I do recall them taking the two minute trailer, showing it at a, at a festival in Europe and uh, really from that trailer made a lot of the foreign sales and with the money that we got from the foreign distributor we were able to uh, get enough money to complete the film. We rough cut the picture on three-quarter inch uh, video to begin with and got it to a uh, pretty much a fine cut of uh, how we wanted it to look and after that we uh, rented a Steenbeck uh, flatbed and literally began editing the film in uh, Rick Rossler uh, the director's garage and uh, he was putting together the picture and uh, I was out recording sound effects uh, at night in the middle of the night I remember having a, a hose on top of my car trying to record some rain sound effects um, Rick would give call me up and give me a list of effects that he wanted to have recorded I'd go out and record them and we'd have have them transferred to uh, to uh, full coat. After we cut the work print, um, next thing we were going to do was the sound mix, and we took it up to Hollywood to have the sound mixed up there. And uh, it also wound up uh, finding out that we were probably not quite as prepared as we wanted to be in the sound mix. So we had, luckily, we had the Steenbeck with us, and we were literally uh, editing the sound reels at night. Um, and then the next morning going into the, uh, the studio and doing the sound mix. Uh, again, almost a around-the-clock type operation. Wound up um, mixing the sound in five days and uh, it was in, it's in stereo, uh, ultra stereo. And uh, I think we're all real proud of the soundtrack that we put together. Uh, one of the more frustrating things was trying to get the money back to our initial investors in a timely fashion. Uh, this being our first film, uh, we had anticipated getting money back a lot sooner than we actually did. And uh, that was probably one of the more frustrating things. It, it, it took about a year and a half to get the original investment back to the investors. And uh, our, our whole game plan was not, not only to make just the one film, but to uh, roll that over into, into uh, succeeding films after that. And it took so long to get that done, it kind of threw a monkey wrench in the works for us. We signed an agreement with the producer's representative, and he in turn uh, took it to major studios, uh, foreign distribution companies, um, home video companies, and uh, was able to, uh, to secure a home video deal for us uh, in the United States territory. One of the provisions of the home video agreement was that we release the film theatrically in several major U.S. markets. We had 35 prints made to uh, be released and the film was released first in Washington, D.C., then in Detroit, Michigan, Pittsburgh, uh, Memphis, and Denver. Um, approximately six months later, the film was released in the home video market. The initial sale was somewhere around 10,000 units, and the retail price that uh, they were sold for was $79.95. There's a number of lessons to be learned from this, uh, this being our first film. Uh, one was that uh, even though you may be a great filmmaker, it doesn't mean you're a great distributor or a great deal maker. Um, that, that became a problem for us because we didn't know the, the ins and outs of the Hollywood system at that time. So that was quite a learning experience for us there. Uh, another thing we learned was that the, uh, the revenue flow is very slow. Uh, and getting money back to investors. 
and uh, consequently that hurt, hurt us because we wanted to roll the money from our first picture into to, uh, subsequent pictures after that. To this day, I'm still very proud of the work that we did on Slaughterhouse. It was uh, really a tremendous sacrifice. We spent a good year out of our lives putting this whole thing together. And looking back on it today, um, I'd still do the same thing because I think the, uh, the learning experience of making the film, of dealing with the uh, so-called uh, Hollywood establishment, the distributors, um, the home video companies, uh, the motion picture studios, all of that was, was something that's, that's invaluable to me and I do it all over again and I hope I will someday.
leave Romania poster, please? The rain, I guess it's cool.
Wait a minute. Okay, go ahead. I hate ballet. I love it. Don't you dare cut her ankles off. Hot. She's got her feet are too big. Swing back. Swing back and start good like you're going to... Give me some action.
Wave Bay.